Welcome everyone. This lecture will cover some of the most important aspects of performing hematologic analysis in non-domestic mammals. Thanks to Francesco and the Veterinary Cytology Facebook site for inviting me to present this talk. My name is Emma Hoiberg and I'm a veterinary clinical pathologist at the Faculty of Veterinary Science in Pretoria, South Africa. Most of my wildlife clinpath experience is with African mammals, but in the presentation I have included animals from other continents as well. I will briefly discuss sample analysis, reference data, and then highlight some of the more interesting and unusual features of blood smear findings in various species. The diversity of malian life on Earth is astonishing. Most veterinarians and clinical pathologists deal with a very small selection of mammalian species. Dogs, cats, horses, domestic ruminants, occasionally rodents, lagomorphs, and camelids. However, sometimes we have to examine samples from non-domestic species, which may have novel features. Also, results from unusual species are challenging because we often do not have reference intervals against which to assess them. One fascinating evolutionary difference between vertebrates is the morphology and size of their erythrocytes. Mammals are the only class of vertebrates to have anucleate red blood cells. Within the order of mammalia, red cells differ greatly by cell size. For example, this figure, which is from a publication that was published in 1875, illustrates the differences between the red cell sizes of various mammals. So for example, here we have man, Homo sapiens. Down over there, we have the cetacea, which are the whales and dolphins. Next to the pachydermata, which are the elephants. Underneath that, we have a whole line of red cells of various sizes and shapes from the ruminants. So ranging from tiny little red cells down here up to um, red cells that display poikilocytosis. Also, red cells from rodents, marsupials, monotremes, etc. On this side, just out of interest, we have red blood cells of various sizes from birds, reptiles, fish, and amphibians. This is a much more um, modern paper. So, in this paper, the primary aim was actually to look at the genetic basis and evolution of red cell sickling in deer. But as a kind of by the way thing, the authors also created a model where they looked at red cell size or um, me as measured by red cell diameter against the log of body mass in all mammals. And as you can see from this uh, scatter graph here, there's not really a linear relationship between size and mass. When they broke up the order, the mammals into different orders, they found that within the artiodactyls, there was some kind of linear relationship, whereas in carnivores, rodents, and primates, there really was none. So in other words, in these three orders, there is no relationship between red cell size and body size. In the artiodactyls, some of which are familiar to us, so for example, this is the goat, Ovis aries is the sheep and Bos taurus is the cow, we can see that as body mass increases, red cell size does get bigger. So the variation in red cell size is important because it does have implications for analyzing hematology samples from non-domestic species. If we look at the species settings that are available for two fairly common hematology, hematology analyzers, the ADVIA 2120 and the Abaxis Vescan HM5, which is a benchtop analyzer that's popular in many um, practices, we can see that the settings provided are for domestic animals and not for wildlife. So, for example, here, even with the ADVIA, where we have things like rhesus monkeys and mice, they are present here because they are commonly used as lab animals. Even ferrets, alpaca, and llamas are domesticated. So effectively, we have a lack of validated methods or species settings for unusual animals. And you might be thinking, well, what difference does it make? 
So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how it does actually make a difference. For the first example, we're going to be looking at the blessback. So the blessback is a medium-sized African antelope. So let's say that you are handed an EDTA sample from a blessback. You're standing in front of your hematology analyzer. What species setting are you going to choose? Basically, in terms of domestic ruminants, you have the choice of a cow, a sheep, or a goat. So you might think, oh, okay, a blessback looks similar to this little goat down here. So I'm going to go for the goat setting. Alternatively, you might decide to um, choose your species setting based on the phylogeny of the blessback. So we, if we look at the phylogenetic tree of the bovidae, you can see at the top there's a big split um, that contains the bovinae, which is including domestic cattle and the trigelophene antelopes, and then the second split, which contains most of the other antelopes. Down at the bottom here in the caprini, we have sheep and goats, and then the blessbuck will be found in the L. cellophini group. So looking at this, the closest domestic relative genetically to the blessbuck is going to be the sheep or the goat. So here we have the results of a blessbuck blood sample run on three different settings on the advia. So the nice thing about the advia is that physically you can just run a sample once and then you can use the playback mode to see what that looks like under different species settings. And what you should notice here is that the cow and the sheep give results that are very similar to each other, whereas the goat is quite different. So firstly, note that the Wassel count and the hemoglobin concentration are similar with whichever setting you choose. The big difference comes in really with the MCV and the red cell count, which results in quite a different calculated hematocrit. So the goat hematocrit is 6% higher than that you would get with a sheep or a cow. This also affects the MCHC and CHCM, which are much lower if it's run as a goat than as a sheep or a cow. And if we look at the VHC or tic-tac-toe plots, we can see that for sheep or cow, the red cell cloud is pretty much in the normal box, whereas in the goat it is not, indicating that the red cell size and hemoglobin content of a blessback red cell is quite different to that of a goat. Another example that we can use is this pangolin. So this is a Temminx ground pangolin, and although it's covered in scales, it is still a mammal. So for me, if I was to think of the most similar morphologic domestic relative, I would not be able to come up with anything. If we look at the phylogenetic placement of pangolins, you can see that they actually are very split off from other mammalian groups. So using a phylogenetic comparison is also not going to be helpful because this is not really giving you a clue as to where to start. So we were doing a study where we needed to measure pangolin blood on the Abaxis HM5 out in the field. And so we needed to determine which of the species settings was going to be most appropriate. So here's an example of where we ran the blood sample as a dog on the Abaxis HM5 or as a cow. And you can see that once again, we do have some fairly significant differences in the hematocrit, which are due to differences in the MCV and the red cell count that also affect the MCHC. So the packed cell volume on the sample was 28%. Now remember that packed cell volume is usually about 2% higher than calculated hematocrit. And so based on that, it seems that running the sample as a cow is going to be the most appropriate way of analyzing it. And that is what we decided in the end. And obviously we did this little experiment on several samples. So when we talk about accurate analysis of non-domestic mammalian blood samples, you can see that it does make a difference in terms of which species setting you choose to analyze that sample on. So when you come to make that decision, the best thing to do, if you're lucky enough to have enough sample volume, is to try and rerun that sample on different settings until you find one that matches well with the packed cell volume. And also remember to always try and apply the rule of three, which is that the hemoglobin concentration times three should approximate the hematocrit.
If you don't have enough sample volume or you don't have an analyzer that you can use a playback mode on, then you probably your next best bet is to try the nearest phylogenetic relative, although often that is not successful, and the nearest morphological relative often doesn't work at all. So this is the protocol that we use in our lab. We consult the literature and see if we can find any reports of MCV in that species or genus. And we then select the domestic animal species setting that has the most similar MCV range. If we don't have any information on MCV, then we'll choose the horse or cow because this is sitting in the middle of the mean cell volume range. Um, so the mean cell volumes of horse and cow red cells are kind of intermediate. So it's a good place to start. And then we'll always do a manual PCV and use that as the hematocrit value. Generally, the hemoglobin measurement is um, very similar, independent of the setting you use. And this is probably because hemoglobin measurement is a photometric method, independent of any algorithms. If the PCV is very similar to the machine hematocrit, then we'll use the machine red cell count hemoglobin and our manual PCV to calculate the red cell indices. If you have a species that has very small red cells, then you have to be aware that your platelet card may well be inaccurate because the analyzer cannot differentiate well between platelets and small red cells. And you will just have to examine the smear and do a subjective evaluation of platelet numbers. The white blood cell count is usually okay, so I'm not saying it's completely accurate, but we also generally don't see wide variations in the white cell count depending on the species setting. So once you've gathered those results, you need to interpret them. And this is another big area where we have a lot of problems because we do not have reference intervals available for most of the species that we may end up looking at. So various options are to use a subject-based reference interval approach to find population-based reference intervals. And the resources that you're going to need to look in are textbooks, publications, and also the Species360 or ZIMS database. So if we were to look at subject-based reference intervals from an evidence-based point of view, we would have to use data that had been collected from um, studies that had been done to procure estimates of biological variation. And we would take those estimates of biological variation, combine it with the analytical error of a particular measure and, and calculate a reference change value, which is effectively the change in a measure and that is going to be clinically significant. So the problem with this is that there really are very, very few studies that have generated biological variation figures for various species. So this paper here, which is about hematology and biochemistry in Sumatran rhinos, also actually did a biological variation study. So there is data in there. And there are a few Congress abstracts. But really using a subject-based reference interval approach that's evidence-based in non-domestic species is very difficult. What a lot of vets do is that they will, um, especially with captive animals, they will take blood from them every six months or so for health checks, and they will keep all of that information and graph it. And they will look at trends in order to see if an animal is developing potential clinical disease or has some kind of disease present. However, obviously it's very difficult for them because they don't know what proportion of change is going to be significant. So the other type of reference intervals, the population-based reference intervals, um, these textbooks, for example, do contain a lot of reference data, but please be careful, as always, with textbooks, often that information is not uh, well described. The analytical methods are different to what you might be using. Statistical methods that have been used are not necessarily appropriate. Um, and there's often incomplete information about the reference population. However, the, I think in the next edition of Shelm, so the seventh edition that should be coming out soon, the reference data that is presented will be a lot more um, accurate and evidence-based. This book is a zoo and wildlife animal medicine book. The reference data that's presented in here is often quite similar to that presented in Shelm's. 
However, this book is useful because there is also information about disease. So sometimes it's nice to see that a particular species is prone to a specific disease with particular clan path changes, and you can often use this information to help you to interpret your results. You can also look for publications. So reference interval studies in veterinary clinical pathology always adhere to the ASVCP guidelines. So those are pretty solid publications to use, although bear in mind that your analytical methods may be different. These two journals here also have a lot of uh, studies that have published or looked at reference data in various species, but um, they do often not follow ASVCP guidelines. Then there is also the Species 360 information system, which uses the ZIMS database. So this used to be called ISIS, but um, name was scrapped for obvious reasons. So the way that ZIMS works is that most zoological collections in the world will be using ZIMS, and they will be inputting information about all animals in their collection into this database. And part of that information is going to be the results of laboratory testing. So this is a very valuable resource for zoo veterinarians. Um, they can gather a lot of information about a particular species based on information that other zoos have given in. They do offer reference intervals. So basically they take all of the results that have been submitted as coming from a healthy individual for a particular species, and they generate reference intervals from those results. So what happens with this is because they are working on information that has basically been kind of typed into the system um, from a very from a population of animals that's very widespread across the world is that their reference intervals tend to be very wide. They also include a range of analytical methods in these reference intervals and they don't actually specify which analytical methods would be used. They include repeat samples from the same individuals as well. So ZIMS is a very important and valuable resource because for some species, there, are no, there is no information on twin path data apart from what is presented in ZIMS. So it is very valuable in that way, but it needs to be used with care because reference intervals are very wide. Um, you may not pick up subtle changes in twin path measurements that indicate disease. If you do do a lot of work with um, non-mammalian sorry, not non-mammalian, non-domestic mammals, then you can subscribe to ZIMS just for these reference intervals or what they call expected test results. Okay, so we are going to start looking at um, little interesting characteristics that you might see in the hematology of different animal groups. So we're gonna firstly start with the camelids. So there are six species of camelids, two old world camelids, which are the dromedary and the back turned camel, and then four species of new world camelids, the guanaco and the vicunia, which are both wild, and the alpaca and the llama, which are both domesticated. So the really cool thing about camelid erythrocytes is that they are oval. So they have this really beautiful oval shape and they are quite small so with the mean cell volume around 25 femtoliters because they have small cells this also means that they have a higher red cell count and mean cell hemoglobin concentration and the platelets are also very little this technical report looked at the best way of evaluating new world camelid blood on the advia 120 hematology analyzer and the authors found that the equine setting was best to use. If you use the equine setting, you can use the red cell count and the hemoglobin concentration from that. You would run a manual packed cell volume and then calculate your red cell indices after that. Camelid settings on other analyzers may not be as well validated. In terms of leukocytes, these, this group of animals tends to have a lymphocytic leukogram with a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio of 1.5. And you will see a range of lymphocytes in their blood smears, ranging from small to large, 
and you may also see some granular lymphocytes like this cell here. They also have a higher percentage of eosinophils than other species, so don't overinterpret moderately high eosinophil counts in New World camelids as eosinophilia. So I have a case here of a llama. So I know a llama is not exactly a non-domesticated mammal, but it's the only camelid case I have. So this was a 14-month-old male llama who showed poor growth. He wasn't putting on weight. And he was being fed a good diet of grass hay with some grain concentrate added in. This is what his blood smears looked like. So what we can see is that we have a hyperchromasia in many cells. We have dacrocytes, so these are these teardrop shaped cells. We also have some schistocytes, so these little fragmented cells. And there's also some evidence of polychromasia. So this guy also had nucleated red blood cells on his smears. His PCV was 20% and total protein 51. And without having any reference data, we know that these are very likely to be low for any species. So putting everything together, uh, this llama is anemic and he has blood smear evidence of an iron deficiency. Combined with the low total protein, this is most likely secondary to blood loss. This is actually very common in New World camelids. And this is due to the presence of humongous, so gastrointestinal worms. In camels, trichurus or whipworms have also been implicated as a cause of a low-grade iron deficiency anemia. The next group of animals we are going to look at are the ruminants. So this is a very diverse group, which is um, present on pretty much all continents except for in Australia and New Zealand, naturally. So we have the deer, reindeer, the bison, um, these occur in North America, Europe, and Asia. There are also 17 species of deer that occur in South America. And then the rest of these guys, so antelope, giraffe, and I see they don't have an African buffalo here, okapi, these all occur in Africa up into the Middle East. So we're going to start with deer. So deer have a really interesting phenomenon, which is red cell sickling. However, the sickling is not actually really present in vivo. It occurs more in vitro when blood samples are subjected to a high PO2 and have a high pH in them. Also, this does not occur across the whole group of deer because it is not a feature of blood of reindeer or elk. And quite interestingly, there have been a few studies that have looked at sickling in deer and seeing if they could use this phenomenon as a model of sickle cell anemia in humans. And so the genetic mutation that causes a sickling has been identified in deer, and it is an amino acid substitution in the beta globin protein of the hemoglobin molecule that seems to be predisposing these red cells towards sickling. Um, as far as I could determine, the presence of sickle cells should not affect the red cell or hemoglobin measurements. So there are no differences in these two measurements, for example, in humans with sickle cell anemia compared to humans without sickle cell anemia. However, what is not so clear is what the effect of sickling would be on the MCV and whether the reagents of most hematology analyzers that are meant to sphere cells for measurement of MCV would work to sphere sickle cells. Deer can also have unusual basophils. So in this picture on the top left is a normal deer basophil, and B and C are representing so-called gray basophils. So you can see here that they do contain some of the normal purple granules of a basophil, but most of the granules are unstained and actually look like clear vacuoles. And down here we have a normal eosinophil. In terms of antelope, one interesting finding is that a subgroup of antelope called the hypotrogeni, some of these species are known to have a neonatal anemia, poikilocytosis, and polychromasia that persists 
up to several months of age. Um, you can see that in these pictures here really nicely. So you can see that in this roan antelope at 29 days of age, there are several poikilocytes present and there are also polychromatophytic cells, giving us the impression that both of these um, photographs are representing a regenerative picture. And this poikilocytosis has been shown to be associated with the switching from hemoglobin F to hemoglobin A, which in most animals takes place very early on, so within the first 10 days of life or so, but in roan antelope, it seems to occur much later. This can also be seen to a lesser extent in some sheep or goats, for example, angora goats. So what's really interesting about this particular species is that the baby roan antelope, the calves, actually remain hidden for the first six to eight weeks of their lives. So their mothers hide them away. You hardly ever see them. And it's thought this hiding behavior is an adaptive response to the presence of this anemia. So because these animals are anemic, they probably wouldn't be able to run and escape from predators. And so instead of exposing them to that danger, they are hidden by their mothers. However, why we have the switching so late in life is not actually clear. One question is if this phenomenon also occurs in the other hippotrogini, so these would be the four species of oryx and the sable. This, by the way, is just a picture of a grown-up roan, just so you can see what this guy would look like one day when he is an adult. So just a general comment about ruminants, and this seems to apply to antelope, deer, giraffes, etc. Lymphocytes are the dominant leukocytes. And remember that leukocyte responses to inflammation in herbivores are different to carnivores, and this is not different in non-domestic herbivores. So in my experience, these animals usually show a leukopenia with a left shift as their initial response to infection. And so it's very important to look at any blood smear very closely for bands and toxic change. And just to mention that in many ruminants, including wild ruminants, their neutrophils often have a fine pink granulation as a normal finding. So you must not confuse that with toxic granulation. So you're going to look for bands and toxic change and also a reversal of the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio even in the face of a normal leukocyte count, is indicative of inflammation. You will usually only see a neutrophilia or a leukocytosis three to four days after the onset of inflammation. Their response to anemia also is consistent with what we know about domestic ruminants in terms of the fact that they do not push out very high numbers of reticulocytes, but rather they show basophilic stippling and polychromasia. And then also just to note that some ruminants have high potassium red cells, and if you are measuring potassium from hemolyzed samples, you may see a pseudo-hyperkalemia. So in this slide here, I have some blood smear images from a three-month-old African buffalo calf that presented with pneumonia and diarrhea. So you can see that most of these neutrophils show some really nice toxic changes. So we have a lovely group of doli bodies down here. There's some doli bodies up there. We've got some cytoplasmic basophilia and very nice vacuolation over here. This is not quite a band cell, but it is a immature nucleus. So this animal did not have a leukocytosis um, and we did see overall a little bit of a left shift on the blood smears, but the most striking thing were these really toxic neutrophils. So this is just to emphasize the fact that in a ruminant, it is simply not enough just to look at the numbers for the white cell count. You really need to play very, pay very close attention to the morphology of the leukocytes. Okay, so the next group we're going to look at are the perissodactyls. So this group is the uneven-toed ungulates and includes five species of rhinos, three species of zebra, various species of wild equids or horses, and tapirs. So my experience personally revolves mostly around rhinos and zebras. So these species appear to have high potassium red cells, 
So if you are measuring potassium from a humanist example, be careful because you may well find yourself having a pseudo hypokalemia. We know that domestic horses do not mount a reticulocyte response to anemia. However, I think that zebras possibly do to a small extent. And I've also seen that anemic rhinos do have some polychromasia. And if you look at their reticulocyte counts on the advia, they are in the region of around 20 to 40. So I think that probably both of these species do mount more of a reticulocyte count, um, response than horses do. Something that's really interesting, which you can see in this picture here, is that we often find Heinz bodies in the blood smears of rhinos, especially black rhinos, but also white rhinos. Now, how much of this is due to a species-specific characteristic of their red cells and how much is due to the immobilization drug cocktail is not really clear. However, we do not see this degree of Heinz bodies in other species that have been immobilized in the same way. So if you do see Heinz bodies in rhinos and they do not have an anemia, do not be alarmed. The neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio in these species is about equivalent to about 1.5. And they also have a range of lymphocytes in the blood, including granular forms. One disease that you need to be very aware of if you are at all dealing with samples from black and Sumatran rhinoceros is iron overload disorder. So both of these species of rhino are browsers. So that means that in the wild, in their natural habitat, they are pretty much only eating leaves. And the leaves, these leaves are high in iron chelating compounds. So these two species have become very adapted to a low iron diet. And in the black rhino in particular, this adaptation is thought to be linked to a polymorphism in the hemochromatosis gene, which encodes a protein that complexes with the transferrin receptor. And this polymorphism basically leads to the promotion of iron uptake by enterocytes. So what happens in captivity is that it's very difficult to feed these animals a sufficient quantity of browse, so leaves, and they are often fed too much hay and lucerne. And hay and lucerne have a much higher bioavailability of iron, and so these animals absorb too much iron, and they end up with hemosiderosis and iron overload. So in the end stage, what one might see on postmortem or in histopathology is hemosiderin accumulation in parenchymatous organs and bone marrow, which leads to organ failure, myelodysplasia, and death. In the not so chronic phases, these animals can have a hemolytic anemia, and they also predispose to a very specific mucocutaneous ulcerative dermatopathy, and they are just generally immune compromised. And there's quite a lot of research that is being done on iron overload because it isn't only apparent in animals that are fed too much iron. Animals that are in captivity that are fed a much more balanced diet of browse, if they are stressed, they can also start to develop an iron overload disorder. It's thought that inflammation and an imbalance in oxidative state also play a role. So to diagnose this disease in a live animal, you would need to send blood off for ferritin and transferrin saturation determination at Kansas State, who have validated an equine ferritin assay for use in rhinoceros. Okay, so moving on to the next group, the Afrotheria, which is a really fascinating group. If you consider that these animals are morphologically so diverse, but genetically related to each other. So we have the Cyrenians, which are the manatees and Gugong, dugong, so these are aquatic. We have the rock hyrax or dussy. We have the artfark, the tenric, and the elephant shrew, which is called so obviously because of its nose, but it is really, really small compared to the animal in this group that we probably all know the best, which is the elephant. So I'm just going to concentrate on a clade of the Afrotheria called the Panungulata, which includes elephants, Cyrenians, and Hyraxes, because there's really not very information available about the other members of the Afrotheria. So this clade um, 
contains sirenians, which are manatees and dugongs, and elephants. And these animals have some of the biggest mammalian red blood cells. So dugongs go up to 160 femtoliters, manatees and elephants up to 140 femtoliters. So when you are choosing the setting on your analyzer that you want to use to run these blood samples, usually the biggest species setting or the species setting you have with the biggest red cells is going to be a human. This um, group of animals also doesn't have neutrophils, they have heterophils. So here is a picture of a heterophil from an African elephant. And you can see that the granules are pink colored. And then the monocytes in elephants are really fascinating. So elephants have three different types of monocytes. They have monocytes with the morphology that we're used to, that we see in other species. They have these bilobed monocytes, where we have very distinctly two nuclear lobes joined by an isthmus. Sometimes this little um, joining isthmus is actually really, really thin, just a strand of chromatin. And occasionally you can see these bilobed monocytes not being bilobed, but actually being trilobed. And then the third form of monocyte is quite um, frustrating because it's called the round monocyte. And it looks very much like a reactive lymphocyte. So we tell the difference between the reactive lymphocyte and the round monocyte because the monocyte has a pale blue to gray cytoplasm, sometimes with small vacuoles, usually a roundish nucleus with a coarse chromatin pattern. So this is a case from an African elephant that was kept in a local zoological collection. 42 years old and male. And he had a history of chronic weight loss, reduced appetite, and coughing. So these are the results that we got from the hematology analysis, and these are reference intervals that we recently generated for a study. And if you compare those results to the reference intervals, you can see that he is borderline anemic, normocytic, normochromic, he has a normal platelet count, white cell count is within the reference interval, but he does have a left shift, and he also does have monocytes and eosinophils towards the upper end of their ranges. So if we look at some blood smear images from this elephant, firstly, if we look at these two heterophils here, you can see that there is evidence of toxic change. So we do have some doly bodies. These guys are band heterophils, so that's evidence of the left shift. And then this cell here is a reactive lymphocyte, so much bluer cytoplasm than the round monocyte, and it does have prominent nucleoli. So there were definitely signs of inflammation, both in the fact that the numbers showed us a left shift, but also in the fact that he had toxic changes and reactive lymphocytes. So because of his presentation, um, he underwent a trunk wash, which unfortunately was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. He was euthanized due to the poor prognosis and also the fact that it is obviously um, potentially zoonotic. And on post-mortem, pulmonary lesions consistent with MTB were found. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, rather than mycobacterium bovis, is actually quite an important disease of captive elephants. And these animals unfortunately contract the disease from their keepers and from other humans who are involved in their husbandry. The problem is that they can pass it on to other elephants in their group, as well as further on to humans. So the hematological changes in mycobacterium tuberculosis infections in most animals are not really well, um, are not really very prominent. You may see a left shift, you may see a mild shift of the monocytes towards a monocytosis, and possibly increase in eosinophils. In this animal, again, it was quite important to look at the blood smear and to recognize the toxic changes in the heterophils. So generally, if mycobacterium tuberculosis is suspected, the protocol is that there should be a trunk wash performed, which needs to be cultured and have PCR run on it, and you can also run the interferon gamma release assay. And if you are interested in looking at more pictures of elephant leukocytes, then this article by Nicole Stacey et al. has got some very beautiful pictures of changes in elephant leukocytes in response to inflammation.
Another disease which is really important in captive elephants, especially Asian elephants, is the elephant endotheliotropic herpes virus. So this is a bit of a strange virus in that it affects a very specific age group of elephants, which are young calves, but not neonatal calves. Generally, calves below the age of one do not have any um, clinical disease from this virus. It's calves usually that are in the age group from one to four years. And in up to 20% of calves, this virus can cause a severe fatal hemorrhagic disease. So it is a very serious disease. There are many different strains of EEHV. Some strains are more specific to Asian elephants. Some strains are more specific to African elephants. And it is not clear if certain strains are causing disease or if a calf of a certain age that gets this virus will develop disease due to some kind of immunological reaction between the immune system and the virus. Anyway, what the virus does is it causes marked endothelial cell necrosis, resulting in thrombosis, edema, and hemorrhage. So I've included these graphs because they are from a case report about an Asian elephant that developed um, mild clinical signs of EHV and the veterinarians used hematologic changes to monitor the disease and to guide their treatment. So just very briefly, in Europe, all Asian elephants um, between the ages of one to eight years have blood samples taken once a week for PCR for EEHV viral load. So in this particular elephant, on one of the days that he had this sample taken and measured, he was discovered to have a viral load of 60 when it should be zero. So this meant that something was potentially happening. Again, three days later, they did a PCR and they found that his viral load had really shot up. And at the same time, they had done some hematology. So in this particular elephant and most elephants in Europe, because blood samples are taken so often, there is really a good set of data as to what the kind of normal values are for each animal. So it's very easy to use trends and kind of subject-based reference interval approach to monitoring hematological changes in, in elephants. So for this animal, they knew that his leukocyte um, proportion, so this is just the white blood cell differential count here, they knew that his leukocyte, his lymphocytes should be higher than this, and they also knew that normally he had a higher proportion of monocytes than they found on day three. So they were immediately worried because together with the increase in viral load and the hematological changes, which they describe as being consistent with the lymphopenia and a monocytopenia, that something was going on. So they kept monitoring this elephant. You can see that the viral load decreased, but at some stage the lymphocyte proportions started to increase. And as they saw this lymphocytosis or relative lymphocytosis developing, they decided to treat this animal with dexamethasone. And this treatment with dexamethasone and the increase in lymphocyte proportion actually occurred concurrently with the onset of clinical signs. So they gave this animal two treatments with dexamethasone and you can see that the lymphocyte count starts to decrease and the monocyte count starts to increase and the clinical signs resolve after day 13. So they were very pleased with this because they felt that by monitoring lymphocytes and monocytes, um, it really helped to guide them as to when to give the dexamethasone and it also helped to show them that the treatment was successful. Okay, so moving on to the group of rodents, I'm not going to say very much about this group, except that to remember that ring forms of neutrophils occur in murine species. So these will be the small rodents related to mice and rats. And that in cavidae, this group has heterophils and their lymphocytes have foa curl off bodies. So basically the, the wild cavidae we'd be thinking of are the capybaras, the very, very giant relative of our better known domestic guinea pig. And so the foa curl off bodies are basically these pink inclusions inside the lymphocytes. So if you do get um, hematology samples from capybaras, you should look and see if you can find their curl off cells. Okay. The last group is the carnivores. So I think, you know, people coming out to Africa to do safaris are always very excited to see carnivores. Must see a lion, must see a leopard. Um, unfortunately, 
can't say much about their hematology because from what I've seen, everything is very similar to domestic dogs and cats. There really are no notable exceptions that come to mind at all. So much more exciting to see them in real life than to look at their blood samples. The next section I'm going to touch on is hemoparasites. So if you look at the list of hemoparasites that can be seen in wildlife, you can see that it's pretty much everything. So if I get a blood sample from a non-domestic animal, I expect to see some parasite in it. And that can range from Babesia to Hepatozoan, Cytoxoan in felids in North America, Tyleria, really many, many non-domestic ruminants have their own little favorite species of Tyleria, hematopic mycoplasms all over the place, and Olichia is also quite ubiquitous. And so the question that um, we often faced with is, if you see a hemoparasite in a non-domestic mammal, is it significant or is it not significant? So in many of these species, the parasite and the host have reached a state of endemic stability where the parasite genes that are involved in exploitation and pathogenicity are kind of pretty well matched by the host genes that are going to promote resistance and tolerance. And so these parasites have very low virulence normally. So usually it's an incidental finding, although there have been some studies that have suggested that overall they do actually have a negative effect. So wild animals with high parasite burdens may not show clinical disease, but they do have an increased risk of predation of being successfully hunted, being involved in motor vehicle accidents, they can be predisposed to starvation, and they have lower reproductive success. So having uh, your own kind of favorite parasite does still have a negative effect for you overall if you're a wild animal. Often animals will start to show clinical disease related to the parasite in the following scenarios. So animals that are stressed, and this is often after translocation or if they're in captivity, very old or young animals, and an animal that has a concurrent disease. So basically anything that causes an immune compromise. And this is particularly, so translocation is particularly important when we think that translocation is a very important conservation management tool, um, and this obviously has implications for reintroductions of species. Another time that you might see animals showing clinical disease due to a parasite is from a spillover event, when a parasite that has um, kind of is normal to find in one host spills over into a novel species. And because that particular animal species is not adapted to that parasite, can cause very severe disease. So the whole, um, the whole question or the whole finding of parasites in non-domestic mammals, I think is actually quite a difficult um, scenario for wildlife vets to deal with. For example, if you know that you're going to move animals and that several of them do have a parasite burden, do you treat them beforehand um, with the anticipation that the translocation is possibly going to unmask disease? Or do you wait and see and not treat them because the treatment itself may be quite stressful? So here are some of the many examples that we see of um, blood samples from non-domestic African mammals that just have parasites as a kind of by the way. So these two images are from blood smears from black-footed cats. So in this one, you can see that we have an intraerythrocytic pyroplasm resembling a small babesia. In this one, what we have here is a neutrophil nucleus that is encircling a hepatozoan. And there are some dots on the red cells, which may be a hemomycoplasm species, although we're always very careful to interpret these. This is a blood smear from a cheetah that has a small Babesia, Babesia lengau. And then in white and black rhinos, we often see a Tyleria species, which is called Tyleria bicornis. And as I said before, in none of these animals were there any clinical signs of disease 
or hematological changes suggesting that any of these parasites were having any effect on them. So this is a case of a black-footed cat that was sick. So the black-footed cat is the smallest wild cat in Africa. Um, it's called the black-footed cat because its paw pads are actually black, which you can't really see well in the picture. So this was a captive cat. Um, it was six months old. It was pyrexic and lethargic. PCV was 15% and it also had a very severe flea infestation. And this is what the blood smear looked like. So you can see just in this one picture that we have indications of a very nice polychromasia and macrocytosis indicative of reticulocytes. We have a very clear how jolly body over here, but we also have lots of small dots in the red cells. Sometimes multiple dots, sometimes on the edge of the red cells. And so we were quite suspicious that these were hemomycoplasms. So in this case, the vet needed to decide. Um, so obviously this animal had a severe flea infestation, which could be causing the anemia just by itself, or you could have a contribution from the mycoplasma. So in the end, of course, this animal was treated with both frontline and doxycycline. So this next case is from a roan calf. So you've already met the roan. Um, not the same one, but this is just a tip, uh, representative roan. So this little animal presented with anorexia and pyrexia, a generalized lymph adenomegaly, and also had many reposyphilis ticks on it. So this is a low magnification picture of the blood smear. And you can see that we have an increased number of lymphocytes, or maybe we should rather just call them mononuclear cells, um, many of which are fairly large if you compare them to the neutrophil, and then note that this animal or the species does have quite small red blood cells. So on a higher magnification, firstly remember I said that um, baby roan antelope do have a fairly marked poikilocytosis, which you can see here. And then if we look at the neutrophil, just to point out that they do also have this normal kind of granulation that is um, often seen in ruminants. And then we have this population of mononuclear cells, some of which look clearly like lymphoid cells. This guy looks like a macrophage or monocyte. And then we have this mononuclear cell that contains this entity in its cytoplasm. So here is a picture from another area of the slide where once again we can see that this mononuclear cell contains a structure in the cytoplasm as does this one. And then also in some of the red cells we also maybe have some little structures. And then again here's a very nice example of the organism in this mononuclear cell. And some of the red cells, again, look like they could have pyroplasms in them, but it's very difficult to take a good picture at this magnification. There's one that's maybe more suspicious. So this organism is a Tyleria species. So we often see Tyleria or suspected Tyleria pyroplasms in a whole range of wildlife. So I showed you the picture of the Tyleria bicornis in the rhino. And most of the time they are not pathogenic. So just a quick run through um, what Tyleria does, or the life cycle of Tyleria. It's transmitted by ticks. Um, ticks release the sporozoites into the skin of the animal during feeding. The sporozoite is taken up by T lymphocytes, and it causes a proliferation of the infected host cells. However, not only the infected host cells proliferate, but also many, many non-infected cells. And in severe cases, you can get a massive prolif proliferation of T cells, which infiltrate lymphoid tissue, organs, brain, etc. At some stage, there is an immunological reaction against these T cells, mediated by cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells, and you get a massive lymphoid destruction, which leads to a cytokine storm with activation of complements and coagulation cascades, DIC, pulmonary edema, and often death. During this lymphoid destruction, the lymphocytes release the merozoites, 
which um, are then taken up or enter into red blood cells and become pyroplasms, which then, as the cycle continues, are taken up by ticks, etc., etc. So this particular picture is for a tylerial organism called Tyleria parva. And Tyleria parva is the normal kind of non clinically disease causing parasite of the African buffalo. However, if Tyleria parva infects domestic cattle, this is what happens. So in the buffalo itself, we may occasionally see red blood cells with pyroplasms, but certainly in buffalo, we do not have this massive lymphoid proliferation and destruction. This does occur in domestic cattle and is usually fatal. So this particular Tyleria species that we saw in this roan antelope is called Tyleria species sable. And what we were seeing was the schizont in a mononuclear cell, which is called a Koch body. So traditionally, these cells were thought to be lymphoid cells. And certainly in that life cycle that I showed you, I only talked about the parasite infecting T cells. But some evidence suggests that these may also be monocytes and macrophages. Anyway, so that's why I've just been calling them mononuclear cells. So what's interesting about this particular species of Tyleria is that it is pretty much endemic or it has reached endemic stability in the sub-Saharan um, subspecies of roan antelope. So the roan antelope that would normally be found in South Africa, but are very rare. So these animals often have pyroplasms, but they don't show any clinical disease and they do not have this massive lymphoproliferative phase. However, in the 1990s, this organism was a cause of severe morbidity and mortality in West African roan calves that had been imported along with adult roan antelope into South Africa from West Africa. So this is another subspecies. And clearly what the problem here was, was that this particular organism had attained an endemic stability with the Southern African subspecies of roan, but it was novel for the West African lineage. So effectively you had a spillover, which caused a lot of problems in this particular population. So this is just another example of where in one species, one organism can be insignificant or very significant. So that does bring us to the end of my lecture for this evening. So really what the points that I've tried to present are that in order to effectively interpret blood samples from non-domestic mammals, firstly, pay attention to accurate sample analysis and do what you can to find helpful reference data. You should have a sound knowledge of clinical pathology in domestic species and be able to translate that into species in the similar groups that are not domesticated. But you also need to have a knowledge of any species specific characteristics some of which I have presented this evening. And then don't forget that in order to fully interpret hematological results, you do need to have clinical information which is integrated into your interpretation. So from me, thank you very much for attending the talk this evening. If you are interested in following the research that we're doing in our faculty, you can have a look on our Facebook page or our Instagram account. I would say, however, that unfortunately we have not been able to do a lot of wildlife research this year due to COVID. So hopefully next year will be a little bit more exciting. <laughs>